Okay, so top 10 sins and struggles. This is uh, the class that you're in. This is lesson number 11. And uh, we're going to count down the, uh, the survey as uh, we do each week. Top 10 sins and struggles starting with 10, laziness, anger, cursing and gossiping, pride, neglecting church, coping with change, coping with conflict at number five. You said number four was easily discouraged, number three over anxious or worry, number two last week, last time was overly critical. So I think Al had asked me about that last week, overly critical. And the number one issue according to the surveys that people filled out was lack of personal discipline. Lack of personal discipline, which is actually a struggle, lack of personal discipline, it's not a sin, but having that struggle easily leads us into sin. So we're going to talk about the idea of personal discipline tonight, and next week our final class on this we'll look at the number one issue that people struggle with that you know, have trouble with personal discipline. Okay? So before we talk about the dangers of lack of personal discipline and how to obtain it, I think it's important that we should first clearly define what personal discipline is and what it is taught to be and what it is, what it is for real. Because people have one idea of what personal discipline is, and then there's the correct idea of it. All right? So first of all, the general idea of personal discipline. Most people, when you talk about personal discipline, they say that personal discipline is the ability to say no to our personal vices and weaknesses. You know, what's personal discipline? Well, I just say no. Being able to say no to myself, you know, don't eat too much, don't smoke, don't, you know, that's personal discipline. So we try to quit smoking, for example, and we can't, you know, we can't seem to do it. And so we say, well, I just lack personal discipline to quit. I, can, I just can't say no to myself often enough to be able to say that you know, I finally quit smoking or whatever it is. We overeat, we overspend, we overdo anything, and we just chalk it up to lack of personal discipline, the inability to just say no to ourselves. Um, so our major concept of personal discipline is this inward ability to resist what is bad for us emotionally or physically or spiritually. Now, listen, to a certain degree this is true. But self-discipline is so much more than just willpower. And those who feel they don't have it are lacking in it because they fail to understand what is necessary in order to possess personal discipline. In other words, their thinking on it and their, and their, um, their attitude about personal discipline is too small. It's too narrow. Okay? That's why they many times don't achieve it, because they don't understand the big picture of personal discipline. So um, uh, there's another view of personal discipline, and that's the biblical idea of personal discipline. In the Bible, we have a clear and complete idea of the nature of discipline, both as a virtue that is possessed and a character trait that we can help develop in another person. And in order to study the, the big picture of what personal discipline is, I want us to go to Mark chapter five. If you prefer following in your Bibles, that's fine. But as always, I'll throw the passages up on the screen there. Mark describes a man who was totally out of control, one who had lost complete control of self. And he describes this person who had zero personal discipline. So in Mark chapter five, we begin reading the following in verse one. It says, they, meaning the apostles and Jesus, they came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes. The Gerasenes were around the Lake of Galilee. Uh, and um, uh, you know, to cross the Sea of Galilee, it wasn't a very, very long boat ride. You can, uh, if you're up on a high enough elevation, you can see 
um, pretty much all the sides of the Sea of Galilee. It's not very large. And you can also see kind of outlying villages, one of those types of, it's just a large lake actually. And so this is where Mark situates the, situ, uh, situates the action here. It's around the Sea of the Gal uh, Galilee in the country of the Gerasenes. So he says in verse two and three, he says, when he, meaning Jesus, got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him, and he had his dwelling among the tombs. So that a man or a Jew would live among the tombs made this man the worst of outcasts. I mean, you had the lepers and you had the, you know, the sinners, you had the tax collectors, those people were on the outside of, 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 you know, of society for sure. But this fellow here was totally the worst kind of outcast because in the Jewish nation, the Jewish religion, to touch a dead person or to even go by or walk over their grave or come close to their grave, made you unclean, made you uh, spiritually, if you wish, unclean in such a way that you couldn't contact or touch another person. You couldn't go to worship. You, you know, other people had to avoid you. So to live among the, it's one thing to go by the tombs, but to actually live among the tombs was unthinkable for any uh, Jewish person. So we continue to read and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. So he was insanely strong, this man, untamable. he was like a wild beast. He was also suicidal, we read in the next verse, um, in verse five, constantly it says, night and day he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gnashing himself with the stones. So he was suicidal, he was in great anguish, living without hope, truly out of his mind. This guy was out of his mind. Zero self-control, zero personal discipline. So we see an extreme example of one who has completely lost the ability to control himself. And of course, the result is a mad and dangerous, not just a man, but a mad and dangerous animal. Okay? So we've seen modern day versions of these types of people. We've seen them in their crimes, right? People who mutilate and rape and harm you know, children, for example, or mass murderers, or you know, all kinds of horrid things that people do in this world. Well, this man was capable of those things because he was totally, totally out of his mind. We continue reading about him in verse six. It says, seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him and shouting with a loud voice, he said, what business do we have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, in other words, Jesus had been saying to this person, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. And so having no self-control doesn't mean that there is no control. It simply means that our best selves are not controlling and God is not controlling us. In the case of this particular man, Jesus' appearance makes plain who is actually controlling this man, and it's the devil's evil spirits that are controlling him. Now, there's no explanation in the story here. This is not a parable. This is something that actually happened. So there's no explanation as to how they took control of this man. We don't know his history. What is obvious is that the man was not in control and they were, and they were actually trying to destroy him with madness. So we keep reading verse, uh, beginning in verse 11. It says, now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. 
And so Jesus gave them permission and coming out the unclean spirits entered the swine and the herd rushed down the steep bank and into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country and the people came to see what it was that had happened. So Mark describes how the legion of evil spirits trying to avoid judgment for a time ask Jesus to be sent into the pigs. And Jesus permits this. And of course he permits it knowing the certainty and the outcome of their judgment. He knows they're not going to get away from judgment. And so immediately the pigs you know, are destroyed. They, run, they, they become mad and wild. They just run down the hill and just fall into the, over the precipice and into the water and drown. Now, there's always a lot of talk about you know, why would Jesus destroy livestock you know, here and, and what were pigs doing in Israel anyways? You know, there's, I've heard these kind of debates here, but this isn't the point. This is a, who knows why the pigs were there? Who knows? Who cares? It doesn't make any difference why the pigs were there. Perhaps Jesus permits this to happen in order to show that the evil spirits were real and not just imagined because the apostles were watching. The man was there. So it wasn't just in his head. The actual power of those spirits entered into the pigs and the pigs reacted to it. Perhaps this is the reason that Jesus permitted it. Anyways, the point of these verses is that the spirits recognize and they immediately submit to Jesus. OK, let's keep reading. It says, uh, they came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon possessed, sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind. The very man who had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to implore him to leave the region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him, but he said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed. Now, the important point for us to notice in this section is the part where it says in verse 15 that the demon-possessed man was in his right mind. We're going to come back to that. He was in his right mind. That expression, in his right mind, is what the Bible language considers as self-discipline. Okay? That he was in his right mind, the Bible could have said, that it could have been translated as he was now possessing self-discipline because that's what the Bible teaches concerning what self-discipline is. It is being in one's right mind. Now in English we say personal discipline or self-discipline. In the New Testament, as I've said before, this idea was expressed as one being, and I'll put it this way, as one being in his right mind. So in his right mind, that equals self-discipline. Now, the expression came from two words, which meant to save the mind or to become sound-minded. Now, in Mark's account, this man's mind was totally lost, totally out of control. He was naked. He was living in a cemetery. He was suicidal. He was dangerous. He was crying out like an animal. He was demon possessed. Talk about somebody who was totally out of control. And then Jesus comes and with simply a word, he brings the man back to a right mind, a mind that is controlled. And we see evidence of this in the, in the story that Mark describes. We see that the man was dressed, he was no longer prowling about the tombs, but he was seated near Jesus. He was no longer violent or dangerous or incoherent because he appealed to Jesus to return with him and the apostles. Can I go with you? Will you let me come with you? That doesn't sound like a madman. He also received and followed instructions to return home and witness what Jesus has done. You know, Jesus, no, you can't come with me. You go home, Decapolis, 
ten cities, Deca, ten, Decapolis, the region of the ten cities. He comes from the region of the ten cities. He says, go back to your region and go and tell the people there you know, what the Lord has done for you. Jesus gives him instructions, right? And so he receives and he follows the instructions. That doesn't sound like a man who's out of his mind or who's out of control. Now we know that the man did this because later on in Mark 7 verse 31, Jesus returns to this area and great crowds await him and he heals a deaf and a dumb man. Well, where do you think these people from Decapolis where do you think they heard of Jesus in order to be awaiting His arrival? Well, these people came because of the witness of the demoniac. Now, in this account, Jesus takes a totally out of control man and miraculously restores him to a right mind, or what we call self-discipline or self-control. Obviously, not everybody lacks self-discipline to this degree, like you know, wandering around the tombs and screaming and trying to commit. Not, not everybody you know, is out of control to that point. And Jesus does not restore all self-discipline miraculously. But in His word, we can learn about the providential way that God can help us to regain the measure of self-discipline that we lack or that we have lost for whatever reason. So let's review, shall we, before we go on. I, I'm kind of putting some building blocks of ideas here, okay? Self-discipline is not simply self-control, okay? Self-discipline is just, it's not only just say no to yourself. Self-discipline, according to the Bible, is possessing a right mind. That's self-discipline. The idea is that right actions spring from a right mind. If our minds and hearts are right, the type of actions we desire are going to follow. Another way of explaining this idea is the following. Self-discipline as simply self-control is reactionary. Something happens and you react. It's a kind of hit and miss situation. Self-discipline Biblical self-discipline as having a right mind is proactive. In other words, you make the good that you want happen along with avoiding the bad. In other words, as a way of avoiding the bad, you are proactive. There are things you are doing in order to negate the bad that you are only trying to handle by saying no to yourself. All right, I'll explain a little bit more as we go. So how then, in a non-miraculous way, do we cultivate right-mindedness? How do we do that? Number one, education. No one is born with self-discipline or a right mind. Education from an early age is the single greatest contributing factor that determines the level of self-discipline that we have as adults. If we're not taught it as, as children, there's no guarantee that we'll have it as adults. Now this is good news because if self-discipline is a learned thing, it can be acquired throughout one's life. It's just easier when it's taught from an early age. So what then must we learn in order to have a right mind? Well, first of all, we have to have the true reality. What is the true reality? Let's read Titus chapter 2, verse 11. 12, 13, 14, Titus says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession, zealous for good deeds. So what does Titus do? Titus summarizes the Christian worldview and he encourages his readers to frame their experience and their lives and their perception of the world through this reality. What reality? That there is a God and that God is able to forgive us our sins and that God is able to empower us to live in a right 
and proper way and that God has given us the information in order to do this and the resources and so on and so forth. That's, that's the true reality. The true reality is not whoever has the most toys when they die wins. That's not the true reality. The true reality is not you only live once, you got to get out there and get everything you can. That's, not, that's a reality, but that's not the true reality. The true reality is not nobody's going to push me around, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm the, I'm the boss of me. That's not the true reality. You can attempt to live your life in that way, but you're going to have a hard time. Why? Because you're living uh, a falsehood. Because you're not the boss of you. And plenty of people are out there that are going to push you around. You better get used to it if that's your, you know, if that's your worldview. So if people have the true reality that Titus has kind of summarized here, they'll have a right mind or the control of self to act in accordance with this reality. In other words, knowing this reality will help a person not to indulge in reckless pleasure or useless activities that threatens her soul. People who give up control of self to allow something else to control them have usually not known the true reality or have abandoned it for some other reality which permits them to cede control of themselves to another person or a thing. If my reality has become that alcohol is my comfort, if that's the reality, alcohol is my comfort. I have a couple of drinks, I'm feeling calm, when things are bad, you know, I just, I, you know, I go to the bottle. If that's the reality, well, you know, <laughs> trouble will ensue. If that's your reality. If your reality is to cheat and lie and you know, figure and play all the angles to get your way, if that's your reality, well, that reality will bring you into the circumstances of your life. But if the reality that you have been taught and accept as a young person and grow up with is, there's a God, He's there to help you, and so on and so forth, then you will bear fruit from that reality. You see what I'm saying? Secondly, remember I said education, you got to know the true reality. Education, you got to know the true self. Romans 12, 3, Paul says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Paul here will speak of gifts a little bit later on that God gives to each Christian for service in the church and that we need to measure ourselves honestly in the light of what God has done for us. No more, no less. In other words, I am what God has made me. I don't have to apologize for that. You know, I don't have to give excuses for that. I don't boast in that. I, I, what I have, I have because God has given me that. If I can run fast, well, God has given me you know, swift feet. If I'm, if I'm good intellectually and you know, I can just consume books and ideas, uh, I have that because God gave that to me. If I have strength or I have endurance, or, you know, whatever I have, God has given it to me, so I don't have to apologize for being able to hit a 100 mile an hour fastball. I don't have to apologize because with very little study I can get A's in science and math. You know, I don't have to apologize for that. I have to acknowledge that that's been given to me by God. I don't, you know, I don't think too much of myself. On the other hand, I don't think too low of myself either because I can't do such and such a thing, because I make mistakes, because I don't always live up to the things that I would like to do and so on and so forth. I don't beat myself up publicly when that voice in my head says, man, how many more times are you going to screw up doing that thing? Or you're never going to make it. What's wrong with you? you know, or you make a mistake, stupid, stupid, stupid. You know, who is that? Who's that person talking to you? That's not Jesus. That's not reality. You know? So Paul is saying here, you don't think too highly of yourself, but you also don't think too lowly of yourself either. Have a, have a proper understanding of who and, and what you are. Okay? He says we should be sober-minded. As a matter of fact, the term here, right-minded. Right-minded. The demoniac 
uh, made no sense to anyone, including himself, until he faced Jesus and confessed that he was in slavery to a legion of devils. No need to explain how or why, Jesus knew, simply to confess the truth about himself. There's no self-control without self-honesty and self-knowledge. You want personal discipline, you have to first of all understand who you are. And one of the things, okay, let me give you an example. The thing I'll, I'll give an ex, simply an example, not a personal example, not an example of anyone here that I know of, but if a person says, you know what, <clears throat> it's easy for me to lie when I'm under pressure. For a lot of reasons, maybe because I, I don't like to be scolded because you know, that, you know, that hurts too much, my self-esteem, and so there are a lot of reasons. But I know this about myself, if I'm under pressure for something, it's easy for me to lie, to get out of it. Or someone else will say, you know, it's easy for me to be uh, unfaithful. It's easy for me to perhaps take a second or third look at uh, a lovely woman or a handsome man. Or, you know, it's, I find that easy to do. I'm not condemning myself, I'm just saying, that's easy for me to do. I know myself. When we know ourselves in that way, it helps us with personal discipline because we know, you know, we know what to watch out for. How can you gain control of self if you refuse to acknowledge what it is that now controls you or where you lack control or where you lack a right mind as the Bible refers to it? So you got to know, you got to know reality, what is real, and you got to know the real you. I mean, it's okay you don't admit the real you to somebody else, but at least admit it to yourself. I mean, really. So we must learn the true reality, the true self, also the true consequences. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Sometimes you know, we're deceived by others into thinking we can violate the true reality and survive spiritually and eternally. Sometimes we deceive ourselves or we allow what controls us to deceive us into thinking that we can violate the true reality and not suffer the eternal consequences. But no. You see, final judgment is delayed. And so we permit ourselves to be deluded by the momentary pleasure of sin, but in doing so, we're not in our right mind. So to be in our right mind and thus gain control of self, we need to keep before us the true reward and the true consequences of our actions. If you're tempted to do something which is sinful, Paul says, think about the consequences. He said, hey, uh, thieves, they don't get to heaven. Uh, uh, adulterers, they don't get to heaven. The effeminate, they don't, homosexual, they don't get to heaven. They don't go there. It doesn't matter what the Supreme Court says. <laughs> it doesn't matter what journalists say. It doesn't matter what entertainers say. It doesn't matter that a gay character in a, in a, in a, in a comedy series on TV is likable and funny and handsome and talented. That person could be all those things. There's just one thing that they're not, and that's saved. And how do you know that? because you know the true reality and you know the true consequences. That's how you know that. This helps us to keep all things in proper and right perspective and allow a right mind to dictate a proper action. We must also learn the true reality, true self, true consequences, true Lord. 1 Corinthians 2.16, for who has known the mind of the Lord that He will instruct him but we have the mind of Christ. In other words, you think you're smarter than God? 
You who violate the true reality, you who just blow off the consequences, you think you're smarter than God? So I suppose the biggest problem we face in this exercise of self-control is the word self. The whole idea of having a sound mind, of being of a right mind, is to give over rulership to Jesus. In the world, you know, the self-help gurus, how many self-help books are there? I mean, gazillions of them, right? One thing they all have in common, they want you to, to take charge of your own life. That's usually the message. Take control. You want to be in control of your life? You want self-control? Take control of your life. That's self-control through absolute rulership of self by self. And you know, everybody's got a different angle. You do this exercise, you eat this kind of food, you take these kind of vitamins, you rub on this kind of cream, you, you, you meditate with these words, you, you follow these 10 rules, whatever it is, they all have a different method, but it's always the same thing. Of course, this may help with your smoking or eating issues for a while, but it's not a long-term solution and it will be disastrous to your soul. It might be a solution for a time in this physical dimension, but that solution cannot transcend this dimension. And how do you know that? Well, you know the true reality. The true reality is that there's more than just this dimension. See what I'm saying? So in the true reality, our task is to cede control of self to Christ, just like the demoniac did, and allow Christ to restore us to what? A right mind. Now what I've just explained, the knowledge of the true reality and the true self and the true consequences is usually what brings us to the knowledge of the only one who can truly be in control of us. So when we know these things, and how do we know them? Well, by being taught them as a child or an adult and taught by parents or ministers or at home or in church. When we know these things, we realize that even we cannot be in control of self. And this is a great breakthrough in the area of self-discipline or right-mindedness, as the Bible calls it. The great awakening, the great breakthrough is when we give up trying to master self, even for good, and strive to make Jesus the master or the controller of self. Now, the $64 question. It's hot in here, eh? I realize that. We've had to turn off the AC because it makes so much noise. Okay, so bear with us. A few more moments, okay. So the $64 question is this. It's easy, I've heard a lot of sermons end here. Let Jesus take control. Anybody who wants to let Jesus take control, come forward, let's have the closing song. You know, and I, I'm sitting in the audience, and whoa, 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 there's a piece missing here. Yeah, I want Jesus to take control. How do I do that? How exactly, just go forward? Have them pray for me? What do I do Monday morning? How does that work? So the last part of tonight's lesson is practical. How to improve self-control by allowing Jesus to control. Three things that you actually do to achieve this. Number one, pray. <laughs> you have to begin by asking Him to do it. Lord, would you please take control? Lord, isn't there a country in Western Star, Jesus take over the wheel or something? You have to ask Him. Lord, the, the demoniac, as crazy as he was, right? What if when Jesus came to the shore, he just took off up in the mountain and hid? What would have happened to him? Well, he'd still have the demoniacs. He'd still be a crazy madman living in the cemetery. But what did he do? He came to Jesus. He came to Christ and said, hey, I'm in trouble, I, I'm out of control. You know, our evangelical friends use the prayer, you know, asking Jesus to come into their hearts or to take control of their lives. And this is a legitimate request. Now, this request does not replace repentance and baptism, but it is a legitimate request. Sins are forgiven at baptism, not through prayer for lordship. We know that, Acts 2.38. 
Jesus said that we should seek and ask and knock and it'll be given to us. You know Matthew 7, 7. People always see this in material terms. You know, we need to ask and seek for things that we need and Jesus will provide and that's legitimate. But it also works for intangibles, like a request for the Lord to control self and produce a right mind in us. Dear Lord, I'm not in my right mind. Please, please, get my hands off of the wheel. Please, take greater control of my life. That's a legitimate prayer. Pray for this, believing that He hears and answers, and this is the first step in displacing self and sin as ruler in your life and making Jesus the king and ruler of your soul. So you want to make Jesus the controller so that you can acquire a right mind? Start with prayer. Number two, submit. Now as the Lord takes over your life, and He will, there may be, there will surely be changes that will take place in your life because of this. You will have to submit to His discipline if you want to cultivate what you call self-discipline or a right mind. Sometimes the submission is self-imposed as when you read His word and understand what you must do and simply do it in submission to Him. You know, sometimes it's like that. And then sometimes the submission is imposed on us by Him. Well, how? Well, through a set of circumstances or restraints or suffering that you must endure in order to be perfected. Hebrews 12 talks about that, verses four to six. You know. See, the thing is, we say with our mind and our spirit, Lord, take control of my life. But our flesh says, oh yeah, over my dead body you will. Because the spirit and the flesh, right? They're always at war with each other. So the spirit says, Lord, take control. The flesh says, no way, and fights it. And sometimes what the Lord does is He puts us through things that happen to us that humble us, that break us down, that strip us down. You know? Either way, His sovereignty over you will be felt soon enough and you will know that you are no longer in control and this will become the source of not only your peace, but also your spiritual power over everything else that once controlled you. You know what I call this? I call this freedom through slavery. I call it mastery through abdication. I call it self-control through the control of self by Christ. Number three, okay, very quickly, minister. Pray, submit, minister. Sounds weird, doesn't it? I go back to our demoniac in, Matthew, in Mark 5.20 where Mark writes of him after he left Jesus and he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed. So what did this fellow do who received back his right mind? Well, he didn't let the demons back in. After he called out and prayed to Jesus and Jesus entered in, after Jesus refused his request to come with him, to which he submitted in obedience without grumbling, what did he do? When, when he said, Lord, I want to go with you. And, and the Lord said, no, 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 you can't come with me. You got to go back home where everybody thinks you're crazy. You got to go back there <laughs> and face them. And you got to do this and you got to do that. Again, he could have said, well, nobody's going to tell me what to do. He doesn't understand my situation. My, my dad threw me out of the house. I'm not going back there. You know, could have, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm going back to the tombs. And what would have happened? Well, another year or two, he would have been a crazy, out of control guy in the tombs. But he didn't do that. He listened. He ministered. He ministered. He went and ministered to his own people. How? By preaching and teaching? Well, no, he had no training, he had no knowledge. He went and witnessed concerning himself and how Jesus had taken control of him and given him a right mind and how this had changed him. The ministry solidifies and perpetuates Christ's position as master. Without ministry, we slip back into our old mode of self-control and eventually all the demons make their way back in and the last is worse than the first. 
I'm going to say this, listen carefully, ministry, not perfect self-control, is the way to keep Jesus as the Lord of our souls and maintain a right mind. If perfect self-control was a requirement for ministry, well, you know this guy wouldn't be in ministry and neither would Marty and neither would Mike and none of the elders would be serving and none of the deacons would be serving. You know what I'm saying? Because if perfect self-control is the prerequisite to, to serve the Lord, well, none of us can serve. But that's the, that's the lie that the devil convinces with. You're not good enough to serve. You, you're, are you kidding me? Your hands are dirty. You, you, you can't do that. So ministry, not perfect self-control, is the way to keep Jesus as Lord of our lives and souls. So for those who struggle with self-control issues, it's not about what you take into your bodies or into your minds. It's not what your bodies do or don't do. It's about the true reality that you ascribe to. It's about the true self that you finally acknowledge. It's about the true consequences that you're willing to accept and it's about the true Lord that is over you and that you're willing to serve. And so a change begins with a change of who is Lord over you and it's completed when your submission to Him is constant and your ministry in His name is ongoing. I do not worry, I, me, Mike Mazzalongo, I don't worry about imperfection. I don't worry about that anymore because I know I'm going to be this way till the day I die. So I don't worry about that anymore. I worry about ministry. I worry about that. My focus is on that. All right, so next week, last session. Last session will be the number one self-control issue that people wrote down that they had trouble with. And we'll finish out our course with that lesson next week. All right, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.